Give me a date and time and I'll help you picture my frame of mind. 13, I was accustomed to the playground and the palm on my hand. Kicks were custom. There was no law of the land for the ladies, man. But flip the script. You're a product of a single mother's insecurities, molded by her fears. That facade you brave is fake, gassed up, and I can see past your shell. Son, you were born to change the world, but you hide yourself behind the mask of the typical class clown. Loud mouth, peaky hair, hard to hold down because daddy wasn't there. Excuse after excuse. Mum at work by the time I worked for school. Ironic, she never saw her son rise. Backpack on my back, not on the table. I'll be home by nine and up late she would stay to make sure that we saw eye to eye. Cross with my pendant, still a million miles from heaven. 14, I survived the beating on a 97 bus. Mistaken identity could have easily been me on the news at seven. And by 16, I started losing friends that I considered family. Fell for a girl that couldn't stand with me. Till I was in too deep, said F it all. I mean, I just couldn't shake trouble. In a state blocks with Cavossier b- bottles fed circling, it's hot, no, you don't shuffle on my own. I learned the difference between familiarity and family. And that right there was my amnesty. I looked up to olders that grew tired, but none of them said I can grow to be an older admired. None of them said my passion can sink ships when you just channel that fire. I've always been motivated, but at 17, I found some drive. Because when life offers you a new beginning, you take it and leap. Make molehills out of mountain peaks or get dirt thrown on you before you're six foot deep. My hands are weak. Now imagine me, 18 in a college atrium, daydreaming. Chris, Kamal, and Akeem said my poems gave him this new feeling, and I found strength exposing my own weakness. Side by side with my old demons, no choice but to overcome. Many directions became one. Live while you're young, but mold the man that you'd become. I admittedly wasn't ready for the world yet. Student loan wasn't enough, I can tell you about debt, tell you about pressure. In my uni room, strapping stanzas for depression. The fact I was even standing was a blessing. I said I could have been mourned on the news at seven. Before 19, I had performed on the news at seven. These are just a few things you should know. These are just a few things you should know. Imagine me, 21 with a 2-1. 21 with a pen writing three twos just to get free. 21 on a good run. Friends I had at 12 on a school run or shoot guns. I do this for mum, but mum doesn't think this can build a home. Truth or no, I don't know. All I know is this is either the warm-up or the home stretch. If you've ever heard my story, I hope you stand for me. And if you haven't, sit down with me. Speak with me. Losing friends is no longer a trend I wish to continue. Man, I'm sorry that I'm still so sinful, but I don't judge a man before I know what he's been through. I left certain things behind just to make sure that I could handle my business right. They say my future's bright. Well, I was born in the darkness, so it's about time that I come for my shine and step into the light. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. (sighs) Hello, everyone. My name is Emmanuel. My friends like to call me Speaks. Absolutely no prizes for guessing why. I haven't always been the type of guy that writes writes poetry. If If such a thing even exists, I haven't always believed that I'd have the heart to stand at the Royal Festival Hall in front of over 2,000 people and tell my story albeit me imagining all of you in your underwear. (laughs) And I certainly haven't always been able to admit that, not that I imagine you lot in your underwear, that was a joke. (laughs) But admit that I have fears and that I doubt myself sometimes. Growing up, I suffered from what I would call an identity crisis as a migrant from my native Nigeria. (laughs) As a migrant from my native Nigeria, growing up in the not not, not so nice parts of East London, Um, Some of you guys are looking around like, there's nice parts in East London? Yes, we have Westfield. (laughs) And living also in a single-parent household, it was very hard for me growing up because I didn't see very many um, good role models, good male role models, and so I had to cling on to whatever it was that was in front of me at the time, and and that often came in the shape of of music, of television, and the older kids in my area. So as you can imagine, it was easy fitting in with the bad ones. 
It was easy fitting in with the cool ones in school. You make enough people laugh, flirt with enough girls, extra points for girls from different schools. <laughs> and you wear the best clothes, you know, the night ticks and, 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 and kind of your Ralph Lauren horses. Anything with a night tick on it usually did do the trick. Um, as you can see, I'm still on track. But one thing that I did know, and I was very sure of from very, very young, was that um, I really wanted to leave a, leave a legacy. I leave, really wanted to uh, make an impact on the world. And I feel like that's something which is innate in us as humans, especially as children. You ask a child what they want to do, they tell you they want to become a footballer, they want to be an astronaut, they want to be a princess, they want to be a YouTuber, apparently. <laughs> and kind of the hardest part is always kind of getting yourself together and working out what your direction is, working out why exactly and, and where it is that you want to go. And so at the age of 17, I decided to write some poetry. And it was daunting as, as the cool kid because kind of you're afraid of being judged. You're afraid because these are your deepest, darkest thoughts that you're putting out for consumption. Um, in fact, I remember very vividly the first time I showed some of my friends in college my poetry. Um, about five, four or five of us standing around in a college and, and kind of I watched them as they listened to the piece that I released on Audioboo literally the night before. And it was funny actually because in my head, I'm imagining them breaking out into this high school musical-esque chorus of stick to the status quo, this isn't you. <laughs> but that's not how it panned out. In fact, it was the complete opposite. Their feedback, their appreciation for the art form gave me a sense of reassurance that I hadn't felt in a very, very long time. It made me feel like I had something here. It made me realize that this was what I was going to pursue. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to use poetry to change the world. And um, I'm lucky enough to have quite a lot of supportive friends, as you may have seen and heard. Make some noise for yourselves. That's, that's my people. <laughs> I have a lot of supportive friends, but one friend in particular that I do want to highlight the significance of today is a friend of mine called Dura Wujo Akim. Um, Akim was one of the first people to tell me that I was special. He told me that I could use my talent, use my poetry to change the world and run with it as far as I can. And so I did, you know. Um, a few, few poems on, a few kind of um, um, shows on. I'd established myself as this Emmanuel Speaks poet guy. And um, things were going well, but one thing that I realized that I still struggled with this sense of identity. I still didn't really know who I was. Um, and so it affected my personal relationships. I guess at a certain point, um, I realized that I found it hard to engage with people, especially when they weren't in my peripheral vision, when they weren't within reaching distance. I tended to drift from people. And that's because I was more concerned on, on, on who I wanted to be and kind of lost focus and neglected who I was at the time. And I call it the dreamer's disease. Sometimes it's a dream where you're more focused on tomorrow and, and neglected today and the responsibilities that you have today. And so for a while, I stopped myself writing poetry just so I can have more conversations with people, just so I can sit down with people, be more open, try new things, and kind of understand the people around me better. Because I guess understanding the people around me better would then allow me to understand myself better. And I suppose it worked. And one thing which was significant that I learned from doing this was that people who were grow that kind of had grown up in the environment that I have didn't have the material resources to access and, and, and kind of the know-how, the, the belief from the people that are around them that they were able to pursue their dreams and, and kind of what they wanted to do. And not only was I a victim of that, Akeem was a victim of that as well when he ended up in, in prison, unfortunately. But I don't want to dwell on that. One thing that I want to talk about is the conversation that Akeem and I had when he came out. We sat for hours and we talked, and there was one thing that he said to me that really stuck to me. He said, for you to be great, you need to be good. For you to be great, you need to be good. You need to understand yourself right down to the stitches of your soul. And only then will you achieve your true potential. And that resonated with me. It consolidated the fact that I was heading in the, in the right direction with this appetite to discover more about myself and the people around me. It showed me that I was right. And although Akeem and I had gone on fairly diverging journeys, they were still very much parallel. And so moving on, I understood that I had to accept myself for who I am. Understood, understood that kind of I had to articulate our struggles in the best ways that I can, and that made me more powerful as a poet. I felt more powerful as a poet. And moving on from that, one thing that I do want to leave you guys with today 
is that you guys, everyone in this room, if there's nothing else that you take, is that you need to find all the pieces of your puzzle. You is an ongoing process. Notice I said you is and not you are, because you are would suggest that you're merely human. But I say you is because you're an entity, you're a superpower, you're able to achieve things which are far beyond your, your, your wildest dreams. Standing here is far beyond my wildest dreams. And I'm a representation of that, that's what I pride myself in. And we can't always change or, or, or kind of save everybody. But one thing we can do is be, be the beacon of light for the people who are in our worlds. And I feel like if more people did that and focused on that, the world might just be a better place. This world where they manifest this wrecking ball. And I point in every boy's life, this ball drops and he faces a testicle, test they call, <laughs> manhood. Be a man. The first time he hears this mandatory mandate, be a man, they say, no excuses, boy, you got to man his life with a firm hand and an iron fist. Raise your chin and separate your heart from your head. Disconnect all emotions until you fail to even see that you're broken. Boys don't cry, so from this point onwards, we learn to hold them inside. Who knew man up could weigh a man down, so we've lost the true definition of a man now. It's an inherent blindness where we forget that the only unbreakable code is kindness, being mankind. The real value of a man rides on how much he can love, how much he can be loved. I'm not asking you to change who you are, just be who you are. Don't be afraid to look in the mirror and see who you are. Masculinity begins with a mask, that's prevalent. Take it off, remove the lie, and let unity take precedence. And life got fun when I decided to find myself. I remember the moment, thinking a man in the mirror really doesn't define myself, you need to refine yourself. You're living in the moment, caught and aware when you're stalling, take two back so you can leap forward, plan B, and C, to lead back to plan A. Just know that plans alter. Who knows plan B might supersede plan A. Show us the difference a plan makes. Make enough mistakes for the outtakes of your feature-length biopic, just as long as you can learn from it. Know that spontaneity is overstated when you and God have had your destiny arranged since the day you prayed it. That's the day you laid it. So it's not the egg or the chicken. It's the what comes first, but an energy that I like to call purpose. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.